Hi, so welcome everyone to panel three. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's thoughts on form and absence. I think this is a really critical area for anyone interested in sculpture, both the spaces of the object, the spaces between the object, the, the object in movement and performance, um, the object as sound, what manifests from that, and obviously in the reparation of any object. So um, I'm delighted, we've got three fantastic panel members. Uh, Tessa Jackson uh, has worked obviously at the Tate between 1994 and 2017, and she's worked in collaboration with all sorts of interesting artists, curators, collectors, um, and we'll be hearing about her expertise, so thank you. Uh, Monty Adkins is an award-winning electroacoustic experimental musician and performer. Um, and I've actually had the pleasure of collaborating with Monty, so that's um, going to be interesting to hear what he says. And oh, Rosanna Robertson, uh, who is an artist. Um, I'm particularly interested to hear about how she's exploring the boundaries between things in her practice. Um, and she works a lot with the human body and more recently with the environment too. Uh, and obviously has shown here, so at the Hepworth, in amongst the Barbara Hepworth uh, pieces. So welcome everyone and uh, hopefully it'll be a very interesting panel. Hello. Um, so I'm just gonna cover these uh, elements here, but it's quite an interesting area, the idea of strings, because strings are all uh, becoming uh, worn out and there's a lot of conversation about what to replace and what not to replace and how to replace what there is. I haven't got my notes here either. <laughs> Still come up. Right, so I'm going to wing this one. So looking at the description of string, the colour of them, the finish, whether it should be aged or not, a lot of them are. String patterning, how to replace examples and some examples of types of string replacement. So I'm going to whip through, I've got a lot of slides. I thought I'd make it quite pictorial. So we, we tend to refer to them as stringed pieces. We say, oh, but in actual fact, the description is actually twine. It's what we're looking at. In particular, it's, a string is a very different descriptor to twine. So they're strung with twine. Um, and it's uh, something called hard laid twine. Um, and it's quite easy to get hold of hard laid twine, but it's not the right type. So if you go and get something from the home base or something like a Travis Perkins line, it's not correct. It's not the correct cordage. It's a really tight twine that she used, you know, for fisherman's twine really. But so it's quite easy to sort of get the wrong twine. Um, I've got a real stash of Kent twines <laughs> who've gone out of business now. I've got a lifetime supply. Um, but there are other ones that are also in business still. But the thing to be looking for is hard laid twine. If you start looking for string, you'll never find it. Um, I also know that the Tate have got a string making machine and they're looking into making the twine <laughs> for restringing. Um, here you can see really clearly the two colours that are generally made, white and then the very dark. And Hepworth really used the very dark ones, but this is quite an interesting discussion now because they look very new and pristine, and there's a real conversation about whether they, they should do now because they're old pieces. Um, so Kent Twines produced mainly, um, or produced non waxed types, but a lot of Hepworth strings were waxed, but not all of them. So quite often come across very matte, sort of slightly hairy original stringings. So here you can see um, hard laid twine, and it's basically a twine with three threads on it. And on the bottom section, you see all the original ones. Oh, and the replacement one as well. Um, so you can see there that some of them are quite waxy and hard, like the one on the last bit at the end, and, uh, and some of them aren't. So you've just got to get the right look for the piece. So what's really important is if you're taking in the apart, it's through a string map, and two of those string maps in the middle there, they're original string maps from the Palais, um, but it's really important where you start your knotting from, because if you knot from one end or from the other, you get a completely different set of how the string's going to lie, so it could lie one way or the other. If you get it wrong, it's really annoying. <laughs> um, and if you see there, um, that's an original string on the left, and that very strange 
yellow string is what happens if you bleach the dark twine. Obviously, it's completely wrong, I, I, but it's interesting to look at it because that bleached ochre colour is quite similar to what you can see now in the original one. I know it's wrong, but it's similar. And I, my theory is that all these strings that we're seeing now are the really old dark twines that have bleached. So, you know, we have to question what colour and what look we're going for because that's the key thing is how she wanted it to actually look. Um, so there's some more original strings. Um, again, you see the middle one, it's not at all waxed. It's not even particularly stretched looking. That's one thing she was very emphatic about, is before you use them, you have to really tension the strings. Um, but, uh, so, and they are all quite different. And the knots, there are Hepworth knots, and they're, but they're all, they often change. You can spot a non-Hepworth knot, because it's, it's be completely wrong, but they're, they're not all the same. Like all her other work, it was often different. This is a set of strings from Sculpture with Colour. If you can see the dark area where that arrow is pointing to, um, that was within the work. So where the strings disappear into the piece, there's been no UV affected. They're really dark, they're the dark twine. So, and then you see above that blue line, there's quite an ochre look, a bit like my weird bleached dark one. So, it's an interesting thing, because a lot of people want it to look original. And I think there's a value thing here. They think if it's original string, the value is going to be more. Whereas when you have a client who wants a piece to look like it should, they're not so interested in that. It's an interesting discussion, I think, about what we're meant to be replacing, so it's up for discussion. <laughs> um, so when you match string, how thick is it? If it's not original, look at the archives, but that's something I'd like. quite like to have a string bank. We've often talked about having a thing about where we all come together and go, oh, all the curlews, by the way, are this, and all the, you know, and often they're not, they, they can change, but to have an actual set we can go back to. Measure how much is required and allow extra. <laughs> always allow extra. Um, dye the string, the decided colour, and hang it out. You have to hang it in one long length, because if you even crease it slightly, you think you've got away with it, and then you start to restring, and you find different, slightly different colours. So you've got to have a very long space and do it all in one go. And then when it's wrong, you just dye it again, and you keep doing it until you're finished. And then if it's meant to be waxed, you wax it. So I normally gut them down the string, up and down the studio, with a large bar of wax going up and down, and then I polish it with a stick, and I burnish it. If it's meant to be. <laughs> if it's the one that's gone. So there we've got a large spool of string for a curlew, and in fact, so the decision there with this one was because the curlew, they wanted it as it was, replaced as it was, but I think it would have been obviously dark red, so we've matched it to the original string that was there, um, and that's a dog's tooth gold burnishing tool there to give it a final burnish to get those highlights on the string. Yes, that's just a curly being um, restrung. So, and then another thing is, with, with things like this, when they're strung, they're often strung under tension. So even though you tension the string, they're also under tension. So when you take the string off, they all just go opening like really wide. <laughs> and then you've got to make sure they go back to how they should. And you can get that wrong. You've got to have a photograph of that piece or know that piece or know the type of piece it is. And for this one, in order for me to get the strings right, I had to put it under a lot of tension. And you see the quite poor picture on the end. It's an original picture of that particular one on the computer and measuring the aperture of the opening. And then cutting the knot is always the very last thing. I make lots of people have a look at it first before I cut it. <laughs> That's another story. Um, do you replace one string only? I couldn't find my photograph before, but trust me, that bottom string, which is a replacement, was a perfect match. And um, and they're really, this is the biggest string piece I found. It had a huge aperture. It's like, I think it was about a millimeter and a half wide. The strings is a huge piece. But this particular piece went into very bright sunlight and aged completely differently. So this year, when I go and see this piece, I've got to age down the string now, that dark string, which did completely match it. And now all the original strings have discolored. Bonding strings, so sometimes for a client or for expedience, 
because they can't bear the fact that they're going to lose their string if it, that's important to them. Um, I have bonded a couple. I don't do it very often, but um, that was a bonded one. You have to sort of... Um, someone stuck it with Yoohoo, actually, if you can see there in the middle. Um, but, uh, so, so is that the right thing to do? Is it the wrong thing to do? Should they all be stripped out and a nice dark red set of strings be put in? Um, Rethreading original strings. So sometimes... It's just come unknotted, and you can actually thread it through, but it's really tricky to do because if you can see that, that's just screwed in. So it's quite difficult to pull them through, actually through the apple, through the hole. And those are other examples. Those are all examples of cut oval form knotting on the back. So you can see the far one is really neat, beautifully finished, and all the others are completely different. So. We look at Hepworth knots, that's what I mean about they, they change. There's no um, set standard. Although there are some set standards, like the apertures of the curlews and things, you know, it's changeable. Um, yes, pre tensioning the string. Again, if you see on the right, all those strings have to go through that tiny hole and then be knotted or sometimes not twisted. So at the top, you can see some original knots, and you can see the state of the string there. It's really eroded. There's no way we're going to be able to use that string. It's got to come out. And then if you see where the bits come out at the end, in the far bottom slide, again, you can see how dark it is in the bit that goes through, through the piece. It's very dark. It's dark brown. Um, sculpture with colour. Uh, so this one here had to have the bottom of it modified because by the time um, Hepworth had finished putting the strings through, there was so much string the bottom wouldn't fit back on, which must be really annoying. So the bottom had to be modified for that particular piece to get one string through. And I think with that piece, we actually used, again, the original string. We were able to pull enough through to just tie it off. I think what happened, it just went through the hole and we tied... A different string onto it to pull the original one through so it's still all original so for some people it's really important it's original but um and then obviously <laughs> another one but with a whole different knotting set system so she uh, improved the knotting system and managed to get the bottom on and with that one it is a replacement string um, but I was able to just knot it next to it so it's a replacement string and you can actually see which one it was. Though obviously we always do reports to show which one is uh, not real. It's another sculpture with colour. This is an interesting one because it has a beautiful little plug made for it and you undo the plug and inside it you find loads of sawdust <laughs> and then a tiny little um, wooden wedge. So when you take the strings out, they're often sort of atrophied inside the ones, and you have to try and poke them out, and that's never good because you could slip if you're using a tool. So I tend to use a drill, which looks really frightening, but if you're very careful, then you get the whole string out to clear, the, um, clear it out from inside. And then with this one, this one has got the proper um, dark string for it, and um, because it was, we knew exactly how Obviously, you take complete records of how it's going to come apart. You, I had to sort of get them all together and then use the original wedge, pop the wedge in, and then have a coffee <laughs> and cut the string. <laughs> when you cut the string, there's no going back because the tension can sag it really careful and then fold them all back in and then pop the plug back in. So that's me, really. But the deciding factors of what string to replace, do you match what's there? Do you match an age string and colour? Do you replace all the strings and refresh them? So putting back what was there in colour and where, so very dark. Would this be in keeping with the type and age of the object? Should this decision be different with the polished work? It's meant to be pristine. Here's a polished work and this is how it's meant to look. So should it remain exactly right? Or should we consider if they're aged pieces and different patinas that they have aged string? Um, or, and just to replace one missing string, I mean, that's implications obviously things change and uh, she seems to say over time over many things uh, but then she fluctuates that the important the important thing is the finish of the work 
Um, mm. However, sometimes she also liked aged things. So it's 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 up for a discussion, really. I'm I'm never sure what and uh, what which way to swing. It's always a discussion, and I think it'd be nice to discuss it together. But um, the only advice she ever gave with strings was to tension them. I just had to put that in. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Yanis Sinakis was a Greek composer. He was also an architect, expert draftsman like Hepworth. Um, and he created the Philips Pavilion in 1958. Um, on the right-hand side, you see Stockhausen uh, at the Osaka World Fair. These two World Fair exhibitions, 12 years apart, were uh, real showcases for the use of spatial sound up to that point. Um, Zanarkis is, I mean, you can see a certain kind of architectural thinking and kinship with some of the um, Hepworth sculptures that we've already looked at. Um, this had 425 loudspeakers in it, and the audience walked through this three-dimensional space. Stockhausen's was a massive globe-type affair where people were actually uh, in the middle of the space, and he was one of the first really to start looking at sound trajectories. Now, one of the things that um, I'm interested in is not just an artist or a musician's response to a particular work of art and how they express that in music. You think of someone like Rachmaninoff's Isle of the Dead, for example. What I'm more interested in is understanding the form or taking the structure of work, piece of art, sculpture, and so on, and actually understanding the techniques and what is actually integral to the art and transforming that to inform formal thinking in uh, a new piece of sonic art. So much more, not just a, an interpretation of, but much more detailed investigation. And one of the things that struck me that's particularly useful for sonification and also useful in thinking about spatial trajectory is when you start looking at the relationship between uh, Hepworth's drawings and her sculptures. Um, I'll go through a couple of slides here. This we've just seen. Red intention, form and movement. And then you start looking at the sketches of Yanis Znarkis. A couple of years ago, the one, what was a wonderful exhibition at the drawing room in New York of Znarkis's sketches. And they really started to reveal the kind of kinships in, I suppose, in modernist thinking around the times of the 1940s, mid-1950s, um, and in Zanarkis's case, the integration of uh, architectural and mathematical principles into his work. And like Hepworth, his work was more about, I suppose, the kinship is more about the kind of tension, the formal design, the abstract qualities, about the density and texture of a work, rather than traditional musical parameters like rhythm, and melody. Here you can see an example from Metastasis, which is Zanarkis literally drawing string glissandi trajectories. This is a slightly more detailed drawing um, of string trajectories through a mid 1950s piece called Pithopracta. Um, these were all done using mathematical principles, and you can see very clearly uh, kinships even later on. Obviously, there's a kind of you know, you look at the differences between the kind of strings and how uh, Hepworth used that in her sculpture and the particular lines that Zanarkis was able to draw. Um, when we're looking even at later figures, um, Zanarkis was using the UPIC system, which is a computer system that he developed in the 1970s. And again, there's a very clear uh, conception around the use of uh, spectral space, the diagram on the right, actually represents uh, the frequencies of sound. Um, he very closely mapped that to the kind of spatial trajectory uh, of sound when he did work in, in multi-channel rather than just stereo. Um, so there's very much a kind of thinking about weight, density, the design and form of pieces that goes beyond traditional musical parameters here. Stockhausen, again, was working in a similar way in pieces like Octophony, um, which deals with uh, multiple spatial trajectories within a cube, even more elaborate, where you start to get spatial trajectories uh, in cosmic pulses. He actually developed 241 individual spatial trajectories for 24 layers of sound. Um, and here you can begin to see possible ways for thinking about how Hepworth sculptures could actually be quite a fascinating stimulus for uh, three-dimensional sound and thinking about spatialization. That actually goes beyond just the kind of abstract, here's a, here's a pattern, but thinking about how you can represent her sculptures and how her sculptures can be an influence for that, uh, that particular type of thinking. This is the, the last slide, and perhaps where 
these things start and come together. Um, at the Centre for Research in New Music, where I work, we have close connections with Kermit, um, which is not the frog. It's actually a research centre in uh, Montreal, which is shared between the University of Montreal and the University of McGill. One of the things that uh, Louis Comer has been doing with his uh, fellow researchers uh, is looking at the sonification of uh, objects in space and how they can be perceived by blind people or people who are very visually impaired. And this strikes me as a particularly interesting uh, aspect of uh, research into how sound spatialization can have a very direct connection to both physical objects and also enable uh, ex exhibits that are looking at three-dimensional objects, not just sculpture, um, but other aspects of kind of, you know, museum technologies of understanding how essentially people who are visually impaired go th can go through these spaces and understand or gain a more insightful understanding of what is actually there rather than just audio or having an audio description. Now this sonification that Louis has been doing is actually uh, taking at the moment point cloud data of simple objects and being able to locate their uh, how big they are and locate them in a three-dimensional space. Um, so far, uh, he's been working with Francois Cote, who is actually blind, um, and they have been able to demonstrate quite clearly that uh, we're able to perceive location in space and we're able to perceive the density. And what we're not able to perceive so far, and they're still working on, um, is shape. Um, but they're still working on that, and it is a particularly fascinating way of being able to think about the use of three-dimensional sound um, with regard to the representation of physical objects. So again, we're not look, just looking at the representation or an interesting artist response to. We're now getting to the stage where we're actually able to create sound art works that will actually respond and give a very clear indication of three-dimensional objects. Um, so thinking about in response to sculpture, as well as other physical objects that uh, will allow blind people and visually impaired people access to things that we take for granted every day. So as you can see, whilst this talk is not necessarily about Hepworth, it is very interested in, in her work and its relationship to modernist thinking as it relates to uh, contemporary sound practice. Uh, and particularly with regards to sonification, how three-dimensional sound can be used um, to illustrate such museum, museum exhibits. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, just quickly thanks to Elna for inviting us to speak to you all today. Really excited to be back at the Hepworth Wakefield. My name's Roseanne Robertson. My pronouns are they, them. I'm an artist based in West Cornwall. Um, recently recently relocated from here in West Yorkshire. Um, where last year I was an associate artist of Yorkshire Sculpture International and I was paired with the Hepworth Wakefield and supported to make a new body of work which was titled Stone Butch. Um, this was exhibited here in Gallery 3 and also as part of a group exhibition at Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Um, I currently have a studio at Porthmere Studios in St Ives. Um, I would say that I'm inspired, what I'm inspired most by the work of Hep Hepworth is how she was attuned to what was around her, um, how she stated I, the sculptor, am, am the landscape, and how she described having to fill her sculptures with all of her body um, being open to the elements and changes and continuously experimenting takes a great sensitivity and strength, um, which I admire. And what I'm going to do is talk about three places and how I've responded to the landscape or the environment which I live in. Um, I'm just going to reference works or ways of work and, um, or ideas that I feel resonate with Hepworth um, and how I've worked in these three different places. So I was going to just talk, say just talk about West Yorkshire and West Cornwall for obvious reasons, but I decided to also talk about 
Sunderland because in the same way that driving around West Yorkshire was formative for Hepworth and how she viewed the landscape in relation to sculpture. Um, I think Sunderland um, as a place that I grew up is a formative experience of mine and links with being influenced um, being influenced or shaped by the energy and presence of the sea and also the industrial landscape. Um, so yeah, I wanted to show this image of Sunderland, this aerial view of Sunderland, to give an idea of my first relationship with the environment that I lived in. It's a bit low quality, but it shows you basically, when I read about Hepworth and her experience of occupying the landscape and the freedom of moving around that landscape, I kind of think I didn't feel that relationship with the place that I lived. I lived in this kind of, I had the expanse of the sea and the freedom of that on the doorstep, but I lived in this very tightly packed um, post-industrial space where the housing was made for the shipbuilders and the miners and the people who worked um, on the river. And it was, yeah, I don't remember feeling inspired by my landscape as a young uh, poor person in post-industrial Sunderland. Um, I just remember very internal spaces, confinement, sort of tightly packed spaces where I couldn't see past it. So my imagination and ways of sort of thinking an early age in terms of the sea or more expansive sort of scopes didn't happen until I had the freedom myself to go and explore, um, finding a way to even get down the river to the beach. It seems ridiculous that you couldn't find the beach as a, as a young person, but how, you know, go and work out how, how to do that. Um, so the material echoed, echoed all around me during um, uh, my childhood was steel and the shipbuilding past. Uh, this is an image of uh, female shipbuilders in Sunderland um, who worked during World War II in the Sunderland shipyards. Um, I've been commissioned for my first public sculpture, which will be um, on the riverside in Sunderland. So I'm gonna be working with steel on a large scale for the first time. And the first time I've really worked with this material that I feel is from the place that I'm from and really directly inspired by some of Hepworth's fluid forms in sheet metal and, uh, and how she worked with, with shape and that. Um, yeah, so really inspired by um, the fluid sheet metal sculptures And just talk about another material that I think really stayed with me from um, from my sort of form of experiences as being red brick. Um, literally the material that I was surrounded by and this porous sort of um, hand-sized material that I'm really interested in. This was a sculpture that I made, which is a sculptural suspended ceiling made out of red bricks. Um, so I built this steel structure and they're all suspended individually by a nylon cord, which I, mic'd up using contact microphones and performed with, so I was getting the sound of the steel, um, the nylon cords and the brick, and really connected my body with those materials through sound performance. Uh, this was a, a gallery called Auxiliary in Middlesbrough. I'm going to move forward, I don't know how many years, to West Yorkshire. Manchester was in the middle, but I'm not going to talk about that whole... I reminisced with that with brass art last night, it's fine. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so West Yorkshire is a place where I feel like I, I connected directly working in the natural landscape and it was mainly spurred on by being an associate artist of YSI and being supported to create a new body of work and thinking about why I was selected as an artist who lived in Yorkshire and really connecting with the place that I lived. So I started out just walking from my studio in Hebden Bridge on the bottom of the valley up onto the tops onto the Bridestone Mirror in Todmorden and I was looking at the shape of the valley in which I lived, um, the shape of the land and how it's cut, carved and shaped by water, and also the light and dark contrast created by the valley and the experience of traveling up and over the tops and the scope um, that that creates. So I was looking at the bright stones and viewing them as these fluid bodies in stone um, became interested in the idea of the queer body in the landscape and the act of connecting characteristics from stone and water with our sexualities and gender expressions. So looking at the qualities of stone related to being unyielding and strong and apparently related to masculinity 
and the fluidity of water bending and yielding, but essentially still having the strength to shape the landscape. Um, so I'm interested in less binary understandings, seeing both stone and water being in a, a fluid ongoing transition. I'm interested in Hepworth's sort of plural bodies or how two figures can be combined into one sculpture, one single sculptural form. Um, so yeah, looking at the term stone butch, which I feel was a term that was handed down to me from an era in the 90s, um, which was popular, mainly popularized by a lesbian and trans activist and author, um, Les Feinberg, who described in their book, um, the most stone butch of them all, a woman everyone said wore a raincoat in the shower. So this is, yeah, I'm really interested in the terrain of that raincoat layer and the barrier between our bodies and the environment that we occupy. And there's a certain violence embodied in that history. And um, there's a dysmorphia um, involved in that description of a person's naked body being at odds with their sort of internal or true gender expression, how they ad identify with gender. Um, for me, working with the, the void, um, working with the, the crack or the schism, these sculptures are titled um, chasm schism. As you can see, I was applying plaster directly into the cracks um, in these natural rock formations. Um, I see this as a transformative space. Um, and I think in the sense that Hepworth's um, pierced forms can be seen to be spiritually charged linking the material with the non-material. I see these physical voids as something that is charged or shifting. Um, for me, there's something about queerness or gender non-conformity that scares uh, a, a hetero and cis-dominated patriarchal power structure. And the joy or the spirit of queerness is restricted by this fear. Um, so for me, this is an, another space, which is a space of freedom. and in the way that the Circle publication had a belief that abstract art was in opposition to totalitarianism, I have a belief that totalitarianism involves this single or binary understanding of sexuality and gender. Um, yes, yeah, so when I, was at, when I was doing this walk from the studio onto the tops, I was also looking at the water systems as they flowed through the valley and carrying out what I describe as these sculptural performances. Um, so for me, these performances and improvisations are a way of connecting with my environment and almost absorbing it or becoming it. And it's, a, for me, a unifying experience. And it's this tension and energy that's held either in the photographs or the videos, which are usually short one minute um, videos, or also in the sculptural forms that are in, informed by this process. So this is some of the work exhibited upstairs in Gallery 3. There's two of the chasm, chasm sculptures. I made four in total, and I made the photo collage and drawing that you can see behind there. And this um, is a video titled Pissin, which was actually made in St. Ives previously. Um, which takes us to West Cornwall, which is where I'm currently living and working. And I haven't followed Barbara Hepworth on purpose. I have followed the landscape and the light, I think definitely in the way that she, um, in the way that she did. And I think some of the things, the way that she talks about how an idea can be formed really early on and then we're working on that same idea and over and over again, I think is, is how I see um, the way that I'm working as well. And I don't think I could work on what I would like to work on in Sunderland or even in West Yorkshire. It's almost like you're taking these things and then taking them into the light of West Yorkshire and sh shining that light on them. And it's just a much more open space to work, a much more freeing um, environment, and obviously has all of this inspiration of these wonderful um, natural rock formations. This, these photographs are taken at Cape Cornwall, um, which is a, a spot where the Atlantic current, currents divide. I'm currently thinking about my relationship with the sea, um, with a body of work called Between Two Bodies and Between Two Seas. Um, I first made work in St. Ives in 2018, but on very fleeting visits. Um, this is a piece called Pissing, which is a performance for camera. I describe it as a bodily intervention. It's literally urinating in a, in a 
crack in, in between two rocks. And um, it's, again, it's, it's, a, it's a way of connecting the materials of the body with the materials of the land, natural landscape in perhaps the most direct way that I could and as a way of using what I have or what's um, immediate in a way to say that we can always act, we can always do something or protest or use our bodies um, in that way. This is a photograph at the Porth Mayor studio. I'm in Studio 9 at the minute on the short left. Um, I was really pleased to get the chasm, chasm sculptures, which you can see near the window into the light of St Ives, and that the first time that they've been all together because we're split into two pairs. Um, so I've been looking at them more as a, a group of sculptures and looking at doing larger um, sets of them as, as collectives rather than parents. And yeah. So this gives you a better um, view of, it's basically using plaster in the most direct way just to set that shape um, in the cracks of the stone and then yeah, not until I got them back at the studio would I see the sort of forms that it shaped and I, I didn't work on them too much after that. It was kind of just reinforcing them to a point where they could hold their own weight and uh, I see them as these active forms. Um, they're really delicate, um, but I kind of like that they're in this shifting sort of state. Um, and it was only when I got these four together that I could start seeing the movement between them or even the sort of flight, I think. Um, so I like at the minute how they're sort of almost like ascending towards the window, they're trying to... Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm working on some more of these in um, different locations, mainly um, a point that I can see from the window in the studio in St Ives. There's another image, which, yeah, just starting to look at, look at them in different lights and starting to see the contrast and the shapes and the undersides and in between them and around um, the sculptures and thinking how I would install um, works like this in the future. I want to put plenty of images in of the studio because everyone's really really loves these studios, so I thought I'd just put a good mm -hmm. few um, studio images in there. It's been really incredible working in this space. And I'm working on, this is a, almost a deconstructed sculpture at the minute, it's got all its parts there, but it's some of the clothing um, from previous performances, sculptural performances that I showed you previously in some of the um, performances and improvisations that I've been doing in the Cornish landscape. So materials, underwear, socks um, are used with different objects to create sculptures after I've made these improvisations. And I use sort of white underwear or sport socks as this. Um, it's got relationship with masculinity, but also it's like this base layer of my identity. Um, it's the first item of clothing that I felt resonated with my gender expression. Um, so yeah, and it's also sort of using this white clothing in a, in a way that you can see how it's affected by its environment. It's usually stained in some way by the performance. Yeah, so that what Cornwall offers is a much more physical relationship with my environment and swimming and sort of to embody or occupy these spaces. This is at um, Godrevy Point and just the experience of being able to swim between these rocks and kind of really occupy the space and feel the materials of the water and stone like in a really physical way is um, really important to me at the minute and I can't think of anywhere else where you could do that most of the year, um, most of the year round. So just quickly, run out of time, some drawings that I've been making more recently in the studio, which really combine the figure and they're automatic drawings, and but I've been doing some more representational drawings while I've been there. But some of the um, sort of rock formations are coming through into combining with the figure and some of these drawings. And I've run out of time. I've got an open studio on the 28th of March if you actually want to see some work and you're in that area, mm -hmm. and I'll put it on my website as well. That's the sea. Hello. <laughs> so that was an amazing set of presentations. I hope everyone else enjoyed them as much as I did. And um, well, there's so many connections between your works. Um,
you know, I'm just writing down words as you were speaking and drawing, as you do when people are talking. Um, so, so just some immediate observations was the idea of like just the string and the twine and the string maps. Um, you were talking about being attuned to the space. Obviously, Monty, you were talking about people in space, feeling space when they can't see physically and how obviously sonic materiality, um, you know, actually enables someone to feel that space. I found that really fascinating. Um, but I suppose my first question for you would be, how did you see the relationships between your work? <laughs> so I, I, think, I think it's really interesting to think about the different uses of strings and um, to think about sound. For me, the use of strings connects more directly with the nervous system, and that's how I think about it. And, and then you go into sound and the senses, and it, it connects, I think, the physical with the non-physical and the physical body with the senses. That's, yeah. Uh, I think from... My point of view, looking at your work is really quite fascinating because uh, often a lot of the performances that are done with spatial sound are often done in black boxes where there is no, uh, nothing to look at. Um, the, you know, in Montreal, it's called the Rien à Voir series. Um, and I suppose the thing about it is how your uh, senses become quite attuned to uh, appreciating sound in a very different way when the visual is taken away. Um, obviously, it's something that blind people talk a lot about, but uh, the more you actually uh, listen to uh, sound, uh, the, the visual stimuli that come from it um, are really quite remarkable. And I think the thing about the spaces where you work is they're almost like encapsulated small spaces um, where I can imagine the detail of the water um, is actually, you become attuned to that really very, very quickly. Um, and as a result, the kind of texture and the, the pieces that you make seem, on the one hand, they're these you know, huge spaces, but the actual results are incredibly uh, intimate, if, if, I, if I can interpret it like that. Yeah. And it's that sense of intimacy with the sound that I think is actually one of the corollaries and how it's drawn together. Yeah, and for me, that space of performance, is a sp if, even if it's a performance for camera or it's a live performance for audience with sound, is a space to listen more closely. And that's definitely part of the experience of making the work. I've actually arrived at sculpture via sound and sound and objects. and. I was interested in the sound qualities even before I was interested in and sound and phys physical qualities even before I was more interested in the um, visual and, and formal elements. So, yeah, it's definitely that sort of heightened moment of listening more intently and closely. I really like the um, image you had of the Hepworth strings correlating with the sound waves. That was really interesting. Nothing I've ever thought of before, for sure. Hello, can you hear me now? Oh, oh it's, the, it's the closest. I was just saying I like that picture he put of the Hepworth strings next to the sound waves. That was really I've, something I've never ever thought of before, ever, for sure. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I suppose the interesting thing about that is, obviously, we, we know about um, uh, Hepworth's interest in music, her relationship with people like mm. Michael, Tiff, uh, Michael Tiffett, Benjamin Britten, and Rainier, and so on. Um, but I, su I suppose the thing is when you start l taking a step back and you look at the, I suppose, the conceptual ideas and how they relate to wider modernism and other ideas that were prevalent in Paris and so on at the time, um, you really start to see those connections as her being part of a, a, an international movement of contemporary art and thinking rather than just you know, an artist based in the south of England. She was also, she did all the performance pieces as well with music and the uh, large sort of, uh, pieces for uh, theatre and dance, so, yeah. Yes, I, I think she, she did all the set design for some of Tippett's operas as well, yeah, didn't she? Yeah. So, yeah, fascinating. I wonder, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience that would like to ask questions, so I'm going to throw it straight out to the audience. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question? Let's 
for Roseanne. Um, I just wonder if you have ever worked in, in Scotland, in the Scottish landscape. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Sounds good like a good while idea. And good while swimming, but in the better months. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that is the thing. I was swimming here as well, but uh, yeah, obviously a different experience down there. Um, I think what it offers down in, in West Cornwall is just the opportunity to be outdoors more, literally because of the mild conditions, to work outside more. Um, so yeah, I would like my next studio to have more outdoor space and to be able to work, you know, the way that Barbara Hepworth described being able to work in the way that she did. Um, that's one of the things that really inspires me about Barbara Hepworth's work is how she maintained those conditions that she needed for her work and that, and what that involved and yeah, complete life goals to be able to ob obtain that um, studio set up and conditions and to really think about that and what you need as an artist. I just think the Scottish geology might interest you, yeah. but also I don't know if you've heard of Cove Park on the west coast and their artist studios and residencies, no. but we can talk about that over yeah, lunch. Okay, great. <laughs> I think there's something there about the you know experiential as well, which we we sort of touched upon in the first question, but um, I think your point there about how for me it's something to do with how we, we if as an artist or a conservator or a musician how when you're making the work the experience of making the work what that what that involves but then there's also you're aware or i'm very conscious of and i wonder if you are too of the experience of the the audience or the viewer or the people that come into contact with the work i wonder if you could say a little bit about that Keep passing it. Yeah, I, I think from my point of view, uh, wh what I talked about in relation to uh, not just responding to a work, um, uh, both with the, the students that I work with and in some of my own work, I think it's really important to, uh, or the more detailed an understanding you have of how a work was made, um, the greater the way it can inform the making of a new piece in a different art form. So for example, uh, with uh, 3D sonification, one of the things I, I hate most is when there is a very simple translation from one medium to another, you know, from you know, some type of data into pitch or MIDI information, uh, because it means absolutely nothing for the audience. Um, and it's great, it's a buzzword to say these things are sonified and so on, but for me, it, it's, it's when the, uh, the audience comes in and they can make some kind of tangible relationship between how the space has been thought of and what the model for that space was, whatever it is, um, but actually then the work of art transcends that, and it's not just about a sonification of that, but it gains a new meaning from that. I think it's when you can communicate that, that's where I think the kind of formal thinking really starts to develop in new and exciting and interdisciplinary ways. Um, I would say I just don't want to mistranslate an artist's work ever, none of them, Hepworth, all the other artists. So that's why I look to what's been done before, what's been said, and uh, I, yeah, I really don't want to translate it differently because it's quite important to... I was saying about the colour of the strings. Some of the colour of the strings is really important to her. So should we be just refreshing them all or should we be putting back what's there? Yeah, I don't want us to get it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Always what the artist wants is the key thing. But sometimes you have to temper it because sometimes, you know, the owner or whoever it is does not want you to replace them. So then there's a historical thing there, but then you're looking at, if that's wrong, I mean, obviously, if an owner said, I want these strings painted pink, that would not happen. <laughs> but if the owner says, I don't want them refreshed, I want them as they are, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting one. But sometimes the contrast isn't enough, so, yeah. I do think about the audience. Um, the, the audience for the way that I was working last year, but the way that I continue to work is partly during the process of making the work, which I really like the, the experience of an audience 
of a sculpture, being able to see it halfway through or being able to see a performance mm -hmm. uh, leading up to that to leading up to that sculpture. Um, so yeah, w like when I was working on the Bridestone, there were people were coming up to us while I was trying to use plaster, which was going to dry in about five minutes time. It was kind of like really challenging to have people in that environment. I'm like, will you go away from the Bridestones for a bit, please? But in another way, having r conversations with people who might not have seen the work otherwise, um, there was a particular guy who came up to us and said, have, have you just cracked that stone? And I, I was going to start getting, you know, told off for what I'd done to the to the bride stones, but it just it meant that he was looking at these stones in a way that maybe he wasn't before, and that we could have this conversation about these sculptures. And it really helped that they were going to be exhibited at Yorkshire Sculpture Park and here at the Hepworth because it, the galleries that people have a relationship with, and then they could go and see the work afterwards. Maybe that's got a relationship with I don't know how open Hepworth was with the public and the <laughs> sculpture garden, but being able to see her works in progress is um, is really inspiring. I know that she had um, people visit in the, the studio through invite, but um, yeah. More questions? Um, I actually was going to say lunch has arrived, but we'll okay. do a couple <laughs> more questions. I was just for Monty Atkins, because you, you talked in a way that opened up a quite different world than we normally hear about. But then at the end, it seemed to close down a bit in that you, was, you said, how could sound illustrate museum exhibits? And that it seemed almost as if that would be a kind of literal translation. And I just wanted to ask you, were you what, what did you mean by that? And did you mean um, how it could illustrate museum exhibits for people who couldn't see them? Um, and I'll be thinking then about you know, aids to viewing or understanding which might be better and alternative to the very limited aids we have at the moment in museums for people who, who are visually impaired. Uh, I didn't mean to uh, close it down. It was, not, it was not meant as a closing slide and a closing down of the argument. I suppose the point was to, um, to highlight the fact that we're now getting to the stage where uh, sound spatialization has, has often been thought of, as I said during the talk, as the kind of fairy dust that makes the, the room and the s or amplifies the particular piece, especially in uh, sound diffusion of electronic music. Um, but actually, we're getting to the stage now where we can actually think of it uh, in artistic terms as a more kind of structural and formal element. Um, and I suppose the sonification example about the museum exhibits was being able to quite concretely think about um, how spatialization uh, has quite a, an important role in being uh, able to think about uh, space in a much more, um, I suppose, a much more kind of scientific way. That it has an application that has not really been uh, possible uh, in the past few decades, but is now actually becoming possible. Um, so, yes, I suppose it did close it down by starting to talk about museum e exhibits, but to me, it's part of a larger narrative about the function of sound spatialization and what we can now do with it um, rather than it just be something that you know, sounds great at the cinema or in arts practice um, adds something to the, the space in which we uh, in which we display work or present work, um, but now has a very much more kind of formal capacity. Uh, well, I mean, we are getting to that kind of stage, yes. Um, you know, uh, some of the work that uh, uh, Annika and I and Kristen and Cara have been doing with, uh, with Brass Arts has been doing uh, kind of point cloud, um, uh, I suppose, images of certain spaces. Um, and one of the things that uh, uh, Louis is doing in Montreal is, t is taking point cloud uh, representations of objects. And at the moment, his research and his research team is literally just about sonifying those and how people who are visually impaired can understand those. The interesting thing then going a step further as a kind of sonic artist or a practitioner working with sound in space is how you can actually create virtual objects in a space, um, that you can actually walk into a room and actually, uh, just with a pair of headphones, have 
you know, three-dimensional virtual sound spaces, for example, um, sound objects that are very perceivable. We can, you know, think about their density, their weight, and it could literally just be an empty box, but yet with a pair of headphones and sound, if the person is blindfolded, we can now get to the stage where we can actually start and fill that with virtual objects, virtual sculptures. That's where it starts to get exciting. But of course, I'm also aware that it has a very practical application as well. So lunch is at the back, and um, after lunch, we're going to be going upstairs for uh, the workshop sessions in the gallery that you may have seen um, on the program. So the idea of this is that you stay within your panels um, and walk around the Hepworth Family Gifted Galleries 4 and 5, and within your panels, choose a section or a subject that you want to focus on. And this could be a specific section of display, such as the Hepworth tools, or it can be uh, the process of bronze casting or more general topics like um, the topics of the panels, for example, colour or form and absence, um, and consider some of these questions. Um, and these are written in the programme as well, so you don't have to remember it now. Um, how does the current display speak to the visitor? And what does it say? How could this be conveyed differently? Uh, what information or interpretation does this prioritise and what's not being said? And this is, of course, um, thinking about um, this network, not just in terms of Hepworth research, but also in terms of uh, presenting Hepworth's work to the public, interpreting, um, and also the material concerns that we've been talking about, uh, which are sort of the feature of, of those galleries. So uh, if you meet with your groups up in those galleries at quarter past one after lunch, and then we'll have sort of discussions based around that in the galleries uh, shortly thereafter. Okay, thank you.